Well, welcome everybody. I love seeing all of your faces here. It's so much fun to be able to share the space together. And Greg, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. We're delighted to have you. And everyone has, has read your bio, as, as Casey said, so they have sort of the top line view on, on your background and your career. But I'd love for you to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the journey that you've taken to CEO of Order. Sure, that's a happy, happy to do that. And you know, people sometimes ask me to kind of describe the, the arc of my career. And to, to me, I say it's a little bit more of a, a winding road than, a, than an arc. And, you know, it's, I'm always amazed when I, I talk to, to people and they say, you know, when they were a kid, they knew exactly what they wanted to be when they were, when they grew up. I have a, a friend who always wanted to be a physician and, you know, went to medical school, became a physician. Uh, I can assure you, and I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of folks on the call are, are like me. When I was a, a kid, I had absolutely no conception that I was going to become the CEO of a, a technology company or a, a security company. Uh, you know, my mom was a, a town librarian. My father was you know, in marketing, but what he did is he wrote advertising copy to sell brakes for 18-wheeler trucks. So security and technology was about as, as far from my world as you could, you could possibly get. Um, and if you look at my, my background, when I went to, to college, you know, I actually went and studied you know, history of all things. So, you know, not exactly kind of the, the kind of typical career path into to Silicon Valley and, and technology. And I'd say that if I've, if I've been good at anything in my career, it's at kind of spotting kind of opportunities. So, you know, I came out to Silicon Valley, went to, to graduate school at Stanford. Um, you know, and you know, wasn't intending to, to really get into technology, but really kind of fell in love with Silicon Valley, kind of the, the spirit you know, of the, the place and this sense that it was a, a more open and inviting kind of environment, open to innovation, different types of, of people. Um, I would say it was not, you know, a, you know, by any stretch, a level playing field, you know, but uh, but it did have that ethos that aspired to a meritocracy. And I found that kind of inspirational when I do to this day. So I, you know, I find myself you know, having moved from Stanford, living in you know, Silicon Valley, you know, and got into a, a technology company. And what I loved was the sense that you could do something different that had never been done before. And the first company that I went to was a, a company called On Command. And there are the the new and interesting thing that we were doing, this was back in the, the 90s, is the idea that you could actually push a button on the remote control on your TV and you could get a movie to start whenever you wanted it to start, as opposed to just waiting for you know, when ABC or NBC decided to, to show something to you. So this whole concept of video on demand was, was brand new. And we brought that concept into you know, hotel rooms and to allow people who are traveling to, to watch movies. And so we, we built that company for about six or seven years and then ended up selling it. And the last project I was working on at, at that company was you know, trying to solve the problem of you got all these business travelers in hotels, you know, we've been showing them movies, well, how the heck do you allow them to check their email you know, back in the, the late 90s? And that's what got me interested in, in Wi-Fi. And so from that point, decided to go off and start my own company and was going to you know, be a company that provided Wi-Fi service in hotels, which was a great idea, just horrible timing, utter failure, because, you know, we launched that company and there wasn't even Wi-Fi in laptops. So I found myself sitting in hotel lobbies trying to explain to 65-year-old grandfathers how they would add a Wi-Fi card to their laptop and then how they would connect to the, the hotel Wi-Fi network. So utter, you know, utter tragedy of a business model. But what came from that was this realization that you know, if you were trying to run a, a Wi-Fi network in a lot of different locations, managing that was really hard. And so I actually we took that startup company, completely changed the business model, and went and said, you know, we're going to become a software company that builds you know, software to manage Wi-Fi networks. Built that company for you know, a number of years sold it to a company called Aruba Networks that was just in the, uh, one of the leaders in the, the Wi-Fi space. You know, and at that time was intending to stay there just for a couple of years, but you know, came across the, the opportunity to work for a man named Dominic Orr that I think is probably the, the greatest CEO in Silicon Valley. And so I ended up 
staying there for seven years and helping to, to build that company. We grew you know, as a, a Wi-Fi company you know, through the introduction of the iPhone and the iPad. Now, all of a sudden, we looked like geniuses because Wi-Fi was now everywhere. And so we took advantage of that you know, kind of industry innovation and that trend. Worked there for a number of years. Then we sold that company to Hewlett Packard. And in the last days that we were at, uh, at Aruba and Hewlett Packard, we started to realize, look, we're looking at all of the devices that were connecting to, to Wi-Fi networks. And a lot of them were no longer looking like iPhones and iPads and computers. They were things like security cameras and you know, infusion pumps in, in hospitals. They looked completely different than traditional IT infrastructure. And that's what led to you know, the company that became, became Order. So it, I didn't start with a, a linear career path that said, you know what, I'm coming out of graduate school, I am gonna go start a, a technology, a cybersecurity technology company, but was just kind of moving as I saw opportunities and became aware of where opportunities and, and where there were big problems that had yet to be solved, you know, and went and found you know, really good people to, to work with to try to address and solve those problems. So again, kind of a, a winding path to get to where I am now, but uh, it's been a lot of fun along the way. I love that. I love that story so much. Um, and Greg, I grew up in a family. My father was a doctor. I have four siblings who are doctors. Everyone just knew that mm -hmm. they were going to be doctors. And I found that such a high pressure situation because I had no idea, you know, where mm -hmm. I was headed at that same time. Right. And so what I'm hearing from you is it's really under your control at all times. You know, you can make the decisions, you can make the choices, you can set yourself up for success at all times. And I think that that takes some of the pressure off that like, you must know what you're going to do by the time you're 25. Right. You don't, you can, you can really continue you to can, explore. You can, you can continue to explore, you can, you can pivot. And I think the, the one constant to find is there will always be, you know, opportunities every yes. time, and especially when you're in the, the technology, every new leap forward in technology creates a whole host of problems and issues that, that need to get solved. And so mm -hmm. you know, I don't tend to, you know, sometimes you know, people ask the question, well, where do you want to be in, in five years or, or 10 years? And I, I think back to you know, the days when Aruba Networks was, was started you know, in the Wi-Fi space, you know, the iPhone, the iPad didn't exist. No one mm. from within the, the company could have predicted that thing that was going to come along that was fundamentally going to transform our, our business. So to me, mm. it's, you know, less about having, you know, always about having your defined, you know, your defined path, more keeping your eyes open to where are the opportunities, where are the, the problems that have yet to be solved, and how can you apply whatever unique kind of skills you have to, to helping to address those problems, and then surround yourself with good people, and hopefully people who are a lot smarter than you are. Yeah, yeah, and the surrounding yourself with good people is so important. And, and in fact, it was some of your relationships that brought you to order. And I want to talk about that in a second, but can, can you first share more about order, the work that you all are doing and why, why it's so important today? Sure. If you, if you think about the, the problem, the, the issue that, that we're solving is, you know, a, it's a really big one in that you know, when we, you look at a corporation today, a big you know, enterprise, there are, you know, Usually there can be thousands of employees, there can be millions of devices that are connected to their, their enterprise networks. And what we found is that you know, the, the world had a pretty good understanding of how you manage and secure a device that looks like a laptop, that looks like a, you know, an iPhone. You can put a, a software agent on those devices. There's a user that's responsible for authenticating it onto the, the network so you can identify who they are and what privileges they should have. But that, that doesn't exist when you think about the world of the, we call the Internet of Things, or IoT. So take a, you know, a video surveillance camera that's connected to a network. Well, there's, there's no user that's associated with that. You can't, the IT organization can't go and put a, a piece of software on that, that camera to be able to monitor and control it. And so what we found was you know, in today's world, the number of those kind of unmanaged, non-traditional devices was actually getting to be much, much bigger than the number of laptops and, and mobile phones, you know, in, a, in an organization. And so the, the problem that we try to address as a position is if everything in the world can be connected, you know, and I used to think that was an exaggeration until I found 
a IT connected toilet paper dispenser a few a few months ago. So now I think like truly everything can be can be connected. Well, if everything is connected, then everything is a security risk. And so the the problem that we solve is one: how do you know what those things are that are connected to a network? How do I tell the difference between a toilet paper dispenser, you know, a server, you know, and a security camera? And then how do I, if I have all those different kinds of devices on my network, how do I know what is normal? What is good behavior? What should those things be allowed to do and what should they not be allowed to do? Because there's just, there's too many of them for any human being to have that knowledge in their head. So, so it's what is the, what's connected, understanding what those devices do and using artificial intelligence and machine learning to do it. And then finally, it's once I know what they're supposed to do, how do I lock them down? How do I make sure that, you know, that security camera that is connected to my network can only talk to, say, a, a video sur storage server. And if it ever goes you know, outside my network, talks to a distant you know, destination, it's because it's going to get a software update from its manufacturer or something that is legitimate as opposed to communicating with a, a criminal over in the, the Ukraine. So, so really, they, the problem we're all about is you know, how do you know what's connected to your network, identify those devices, understand their behaviors, and then use and, and create policies to lock those devices down and protect them to make sure that they don't become a pathway by which you know, intruders can get into the a corporate network and, and compromise the, the data of that enterprise. Mm -hmm. Greg, I think this is so interesting. We've, you and I were talking about Kevin Mandia um, when we were prepping for this call. Mm -hmm. He's the CEO of FireEye. They just announced a huge, you know, billion dollar plus transaction. Mm -hmm. And he's come to speak in Breakline before. And he has said that he doesn't think international cyber warfare would, would start with like, power plants and, you know, and water plants and stuff like that. He said he thought it would start with the devices in our home mm -hmm. that like your refrigerator would just shut off or your right. freezer, or it would order thousands of dollars worth of groceries or something mm -hmm. like that. Like he, he envisioned it as like individualized chaos rather than right. these, you know, massive shutdowns of plants and stuff. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I think they, the line really does blur between the, the home and the, the workplace environment. If, you, if I go into you know, a, a workplace back when we're allowed to go into workplaces, you know, if you look in the, the, the break room, look at the, the microwave oven, the refrigerator, all, there are these, all these consumer devices that are in an enterprise environment that are now you know, connected. So you know, that, that type of chaos that Kevin is talking about that can hit consumer devices, you know, can also be brought into the, the enterprise environment. And that's, mm -hmm. it's really important because a lot of times, and I think one of the points that Kevin was making is that consumer devices very often aren't built with security you know, in mind. Whereas if you're yeah. building a nuclear power plant, you're probably thinking about how do we protect all of this to make sure that, that no one can break into the environment. You don't typically think about like, how do I protect Greg Murphy's refrigerator? That's of vital national security interest. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it's those, you know, any one of those connected devices can be a point of vulnerability, can be a way that an intruder gets into your, your network environment and moves from that seemingly unimportant device to kind of the, the critical assets, your, your own personal data, or in a corporate context, all of the, the enterprise assets. And that, that's really, you know, it's interesting because when you think about security and the, the threats today, I think as Kevin rightly pointed out, you, if you watch 24, you watch the movies, you always see you know, there's some hacker who is breaking into a nuclear power plant, doing something that causes the reactor to melt down and chaos ensues. And that's the, the nightmare scenario. And it's, it's, not, you know, it's not implausible, unfortunately. But the more common reality is you know, manufacturing firms are, are being attacked by just common criminals. You know, who, mm -hmm. They're not out to, you know, shut, to, to cause a nuclear explosion. They're just looking to make a buck. These are you know, corporations and they, they act like companies. They have customer support organizations that help you pay your ransomware fees to them and make sure that you're getting all the, the support you need as you're dealing with their, their attack. And I think the, the problem is that you know, while there are a few really sophisticated nation states out there, there are tens of millions of, of criminals and they are targeting everyone from consumers, as Kevin is pointing out, small businesses, large enterprises, and that's the, the world that we, we operate in today. Mm -hmm. There's a line of 
commentary in the chat, Joshua Clark, Demi, Harry, Wilson, saying this feels so pertinent right now, given the recent attacks, the oil supply chain in the Southeastern US, JBS, MTA, the meat packing industry, which I hadn't heard of, mm -hmm. um, but just, you know, how do you, it just feels, it can sometimes feel like these attacks are coming from everywhere and all at once. And how do you um, like stay focused mm -hmm. and not have just a total meltdown? <laughs> right. <laughs> like how, how massive this problem is, which also means it's a massive opportunity to solve. Right. It, it is a it is a massive opportunity, and I, I think if you just you look at the the news, like we were you know we were just uh, talking about just in the the past few weeks, you've got the the Colonial Pipeline. So you know, I was out in in Georgia a few weeks ago and saw the people no longer driving, you know, Uber drivers not being available because there was no gas, you know, and then this past week in the meat packing where they were worried that the, the supply of meat to the you know, US would be significantly disrupted at 20% of the, the capacity of you know, our meat production you know, at, uh, at risk. And I, I think the, the, the way you need to, to think about this and the way you kind of stay sane is to, to recognize that these types of attacks you know, are coming. There is no organization that can put in place such sophisticated defenses that they will never be, that they're not going to be subject to attack, that they're going to be immune. A lot of the, the strategies that need to get put in place are how do you minimize the impact you know, of any one of those attacks? And you know, that can come in, in one of the things that we spend a lot of our time working on are what's called segmentation. So if my, to kind of continue to harp on the example of, of video surveillance cameras, if my surveillance cameras are compromised, well, that, that's bad. But it is much worse if the intruder can move from those video surveillance cameras to you know, the pepperoni slicer, to the you know, whatever the production capacity of the plant is, or to you know, a medical device if we're talking about a, a hospital environment. So part of what needs to be done is you know, really thinking about you know, how do you minimize the ability of these attackers to move kind of laterally across an, an organization because what they're really looking to do is just find a, a way in and then figure out how they move from that entry point to valuable data that they could then you know, encrypt, that they could you know, charge you money to, to get access back. So it, it's really kind of thinking about this in you know, defense in depth, thinking about different ways, understand that you will be attacked, you know, think through how do you make sure that it's going to be a blip as opposed mm. to something that takes down your entire hospital, your entire manufacturing plant, all of your, your production capability. Mm -hmm. I want to transition to your comment about surrounding yourself with really smart people and great mm -hmm. people, because that's definitely one of our um, theses at Breakline as well. And you knew the two co-founders of Order, mm -hmm. and, right. um, and that was the relationship that was sort of pivotal with you making the decision to join the company as CEO. Um, but it's also, it can be kind of tricky to join a company as CEO when the founders are still there, then moving into, you know, different capacities at the company. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship that, that the three of you have and, um, and, and how you have managed to kind of um, carve out different areas of focus for, for each of you? Right. No, it's a, it is a, it's a great question. And you know, I was I was really fortunate when I came in to to join you know, Order, as you, you mentioned, that the company had been founded by two just absolutely brilliant people, Panvian and, and Shashan, uh, who were the, the co-founders. And I was really lucky that I had worked with them you know, previously at Aruba Networks. You know, Panvian had run you know, our you know, product organization, so we, we ran all of engineering and product management. Shashang was the, the chief architect. So, you know, number, you know, number one, knowing the people, you know, and their capabilities gave me enormous confidence that the, the technology that they would be building was going to be, you know, is going to be rock solid. It's going to be something that, you know, we could really build into a, a great organization. Um, and then, you know, I, I think it also is an advantage. Obviously, you, you know people, you know their strengths, you know their weaknesses, and they know yours. And so you have a it's always easier to, to work with people that you've built a, a relationship of, of trust with. So I felt very, very blessed to come into an organization where I had that. And not only with Pandian and Shashang, but the, 
chairman of the company was uh, Dominic Orr, who had been the CEO at Aruba. So for me, it really was kind of a, a very familiar environment. But I think the, to your point, the, the trick is to come into a new organization. I think this is true whether you're coming in as the CEO or you're coming in you know, as an individual contributor, is to understand that companies and, and organizations have their own culture and their own dynamics that you can't just go and try to make, I couldn't try to make order just a replica of Aruba. No matter how much I loved Aruba, the, the culture that we had built there, there were things that you wanted to, to transplant over into the, the new environment. But there are other things, other traditions, cultures that were different about, you know, about order and need to, to adapt and understand what's working. You know, what are the things you want to change? But equally important and probably even more critical in some cases, are what are the things you don't want to change? Like what is that, what is really essential to keep at the at the core of the, the company? And, and here, you know, I was really you know, very fortunate to have you know, founders who were uh, very eager to have you know, come in to help grow the, the organization and also you know, very you know, clearly defined responsibilities. You know, so you know, the Pandian and Shoshone you know, really, you know, from a technical perspective, building a product, you know, absolute you know, geniuses. You know, where I was coming in to focus on now, how do we take what they've built and how do we get that to, to market? And so I had, that was my primary area of focus. And as a, a CEO, you're responsible for everything, but we had fairly you know, clear areas of, of responsibility. And then the other responsibilities, how do we then build the rest of the team? What are the other missing pieces that we have here from a sales perspective, a marketing perspective to really make sure that we've got all of the, the team members in, in place that we want and how do we make sure that we're bringing in team members that will add to, contribute to, you know, to that culture in a very productive way. Mm -hmm. And what are you looking for? We have a bunch of folks kind of, you know, raising their hand and saying, ooh, this sounds like a really cool problem to be working on. Mm -hmm. When you think about hiring for your team, um, outside of the functional area, like software engineering or marketing or operations, mm -hmm. what are you looking for in the individual? You know, what do you, what do you think about when you're, when you're assessing whether someone can really add value at order? You know, the, the, the number one thing that I, you know, I tend to think of is the, the cultural fit. And, you know, I, I've talked to a number of HR people and that sometimes sets up, you know, warning flags. And look, you, when you talk about cultural fit, it doesn't mean, you know, people who look like and think like, you know, everybody who's currently in the organization, but the culture that we have, you know, at, you know, at order, the culture that I really pulled from you know, Aruba, you know, I think was you know, really embodied this, was what we call this customer first, customer last culture. You know, we want people who come in and say, our job, our mission, above everything else, is to make sure our customers are successful. Okay. And if you, so what I'm looking for when I talk to people, do you have that customer orientation? The, the phrase that I, that I hate more than any other is, it's not my job. If, if I look at it and say, if I have a customer uh, who is having a problem, can we do a collective groan? Yeah. <laughs> it's yes. the worst. Right. And, you know, it's, it's legitimate, you know, after the fact to point out, say, hey, wait a minute, I really shouldn't have been dealing with this issue. Someone else should have been dealing with it. It would have been better to be handled differently. But when a customer is having a problem, we must solve it. You know, and I think that comes, I've, I've got that kind of orientation because in my career, I have always worked for smaller companies that were competing with a much larger you know, established player. When we, in the very early days you know, at Airwave, my software company, we were competing with Cisco at the time. And for every single customer that we ever sold to, it would have been an easier decision for them to buy from Cisco. Their manager would never have called them and questioned them and say, well, why are you making a selection to buy from Cisco? Every single one of them in the early days probably got that question, of why are you buying from this little company based in San Mateo, California that nobody has ever heard of? And to me, that kind of, when you have a customer and you're that type of company or a small startup company, you have a sacred obligation to make them successful because they're sticking their neck out. In some cases, they may be putting their job on the line because they think you've got a better product and a better technology. And so it goes down beyond just a, a business issue that I better take care of this customer, make them successful, or I'm not going to have a business, but it actually gets down to kind of a moral issue. This, this person put their neck out for me, I owe them success. And that, that's kind of the, 
more than anything else, it's that orientation I'm looking for when we you know, talk to people in an organization. Do they have a curiosity about the customer? Do they have empathy? Can they put themselves in the, the customer's shoes? You know, and when they, they see problems, do they have that instinct to want to run towards that problem and solve it? And that, when I'm interviewing, that, that's what I'm trying to look for more than, more than anything. So that's the kind of culture that we have, uh, that we have at the, the company and it's the kind of culture we want to build and strengthen. Mm-hmm. I love the hustle, the hustle yeah. factor, the grit. That's awesome. I'm going to ask one more question. Then we have tons of questions coming into the chat, Greg. So I want to um, turn it over to our, our break liners as well. Mm-hmm. But this one, at, at the onset of the conversation, you mentioned policy and, and policy solutions as being an important part of our security sort of infrastructure. Mm-hmm. The IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020 was passed by Congress last year. And you wrote an article in Forbes about the importance of this bill. Mm-hmm. Will you talk a little bit about um, the attacks that were happening that helped actually to get this in motion and any improvements you've seen since it passed and also how it um, how it intersects with order and the work that you all are doing right yeah it's a it's a it's a good question and I think that you know they the fact that Congress was able to pass the the IOT cybersecurity improvement act you know late last year and it actually got signed by the president if if those folks could agree you know on that last year it tells you it's a pretty big and pretty important issue it's uh it's and you know I think what uh what really had been, been happening is that there had been a, a number of security incidents that related to, to IoT devices. You know, and there was you know, a, you know, a, a malware called Mirai. There was a variant of that that really impacted kind of tens of thousands of, you know, of devices. There were you know, issues that uh, the world seen of you know, Chinese made cameras that were demonstrated to be calling home to their, their manufacturers, which raised some obvious, you know, obvious questions for the, the government from a national security perspective. Um, there was a you know, one that really sticks out in, in my memory in the, the medical space. There was a, a black hat conference, it was a cybersecurity conference where they demonstrated that an infusion pump, which pumps drugs into to patients in the, the hospital could be, could be hacked. Someone could take that device over and change the dosage. So you could literally you know, kill a person by taking over these devices. And so it was like, a series of those types of, of both cybersecurity incidences as well as kind of demonstration, but I think really kind of raised this, this issue and said there are, when it comes to the, the world of IoT, there are literally tens of thousands of different manufacturers, you know, all with their own proprietary software system. And it was incredibly difficult for an organization to understand just how secure were these devices, what capabilities do they have. And so the IoT Cybersecurity Act just basically says. It's using the government's power as a buyer. Because if you are going to sell an IoT device to the US federal government, then you must follow standards that will be developed by the by NIST, the National Institute of Standard and Technology. And so since most organizations aspire to sell to the federal government in, in some fashion or another, it really is kind of the, the federal government using its power to shape you know, an industry. And so we're in the very early stages, they, the NIST now needs to go and define exactly what those specific requirements will be. And then it's going to be, you know, then the, the government says, all right, once those standards are defined, then, you know, the government will only procure devices that can be demonstrated to comply with those standards. So it's a huge step in the right direction, you know, of actually putting enforcement and using buying power to make sure that vendors that are selling to the government uh, have basic capabilities in place, but you know, fundamentally, it's not going to do anything to change the fact that there's you know tens of billions of dollars of existing infrastructure that's that's already been procured, it's already connected, that's out there, and it still isn't going to solve the problem. These devices, no device can be made impenetrable. You can apply to these standards, you can have you know, secure passwords. Other than there will be still be breaches, and so there needs to be accompanied with that an expectation that organizations aren't going to say, well, good, you know, this IoT Cybersecurity Act was passed, devices are meeting these minimum standards, so we no longer need to worry, we no longer need to monitor these devices, because that's, you know, fundamentally, you know, flawed thinking. There is no silver bullet that is going to make a particular device secure its layers of security, making sure that basic standards are met, making sure that you're monitoring, making sure that you're implementing policies to protect these devices. 
So mm -hmm. hugely important, and it was great to see kind of the federal government taking action because frankly, I think this problem is of such a scope, it would be really hard to get that type of mandate across so many different suppliers without some form of federal government action. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to questions from our audience and these range from the strategic to the operational to the hyper nerdy. And so we'll just kind of take it, take it one at a time here. Harry has a question and several people have doubled down on this one. So I'm starting here. What changes to, to the cybersecurity field have you witnessed with the recent paradigm shift from centralized in-office work with controlled network operations to decentralized remote work and disaggregated networks and possibly increased vulnerability? It's a it's a great question, you know, because I, I think as you as you move to kind of a more decentralized, you move to having more, you know, more remote workers, obviously that's bringing into scope a, a lot more different, you know, different types of devices. It's kind of blending the, the home world and the, the work world, you know, and makes it, you know, there are a couple of things that are happening. One, more and more of those devices are connecting directly to the, the cloud, you know, so that you know, as opposed to going back and running back through the, the enterprise in some fashion. So it makes, you know, puts a premium on organizations monitoring kind of all of their assets in the, the data in the cloud to make sure that it's not being compromised. Also makes it, it puts a real premium on understanding, you know, what these devices are and, and, and how they're being used. I mean, you have so little control, you know, in a, a home environment. I think someone, you know, in the, the chat window is talking about USB you know, sticks in, in whether you can use you know, USB storage devices, you know, in a, in a work environment. Well, you know, very, very hard to, to mandate and control and say that, you know, my, you know, my cousins, my nephews, my kids who come over to our house, you know, aren't going to do something, aren't going to put, you know, a memory device in my computer. And so making sure that organizations really have, you know, tight controls on the devices that are under their control, you know, that are, that they are managing, but also that they've got visibility to all of these devices and their behavior. So they can start to, they can realize if something unusual is starting to happen. You you suddenly have a, a device that is communicating with you know your financial systems that has never communicated with your financial systems as a company before. That starts to look like an anomalous behavior pattern that you better be aware of and look into as a security organization. So I think this this kind of shift from in office to remote has put a premium on having kind of visibility and using you know, things like AI and machine learning to identify Kind of anomalous patterns, things that don't look like they conform to expected behaviors so that IT can then investigate and, and take action. Because again, you can't be perfect. You can't prevent every, every breach. It's a question of how quickly do you uh, detect them and you know, what can you do to make sure when they happen that the, the blast radius of the incident is you know, relatively minor as opposed to something that takes down you know, an entire organization. That was an interesting analogy. Partha has a question for you. He says, if Order's solution is able to passively identify and detect cyber vulnerabilities on a network, does that mean that the solution is agentless and instead exists on network devices that all the IoT connect to? Partha is starting to use English language in a way that I don't understand. So I'm going <laughs> to yep. continue paraphrasing here. If so, wouldn't that be limiting your access and visibility over the end devices? Or does your solution more focus on ensuring all devices connecting to a network are CMMC compliant? And Partha, could you please um, put whatever the hell that means <laughs> into the chat? <laughs> no, it, Partha, Partha knows his stuff. I, those are, that's really, that's great. Um, and, yeah, and CMMC compliance is a big issue for, you know, for manufacturers as well. You know, the, no, the, you're absolutely right. The, if you think of the, the world of devices that IT is being tasked to, to dealing with now, if you, I, I tend to think of them as the well, traditional devices, like the, the laptops and the, you know, the mobile phones, servers, you know, the, you know, traditional IT devices on which the IT organization can install a software agent, is what, what Arthur was talking about, agents. Is, and that agent will give you know, the ability to visibility of what that device is doing, how it's behaving, and will generally give the IT organization some ability to control the device, to shut down things. If, if it appears to be doing something that it's not supposed to be doing, 
well, block that, you know, block that communication. So having the ability to put a software agent is the very traditional way that organizations have you know, achieved control over devices. Partha, you're absolutely right. When we, we think about the, the IoT you know, kind of world and all of these other devices, it is not possible to put software agents on, on all of these devices. You know, one, you know, sometimes you're prevented from doing it, like the FDA won't let you put a, an agent on you know, a lot of medical equipment, or these devices don't have enough storage space, they've got proprietary operating systems. It's just when you think about how many different you know, IoT devices are from your refrigerator and your, your, your microwave all the way up to, to multi-million dollar kind of manufacturing systems, there's no way that you could put agents on all of those. And so we take a, a passive monitoring approach saying, you know what, we don't have the visibility that comes from sitting on the device, but we can watch what that device does. We can watch how it communicates. So we can say, you know, hey, wait a minute, why does that, you know, why does that microwave oven, why is it communicating to a, a server in Iran? That doesn't seem like it's normal expected behavior for a microwave. And we've watched you know, thousands of microwaves for a long period of time. None of them have ever done that before. Now that becomes a trigger that something anomalous is going on that IT should be aware of. And then you can give them the ability to say, now I'd like to shut down that communication. I want to make sure that device is not able to communicate to Iran, for example. So it, it really does come of the only way with all of the devices that are connected, there's no hope of putting agents on all of those devices. The only way to get a full view of what's happening on the network is kind of with this agentless passive monitoring approach of just watching all of the network traffic. And that's what we focus on. That's what we do as an organization. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg. Kunal has a question. He says, in your opinion, what's the biggest non-technical security threat that makes organizations vulnerable to these attacks? And he says, it seems the recent attacks were complex and required social engineering to execute. Yeah, I, I think that there are you know, a couple of answers. I say the, by far the most common you know, attack these days is you know, simple you know, email you know, phishing you know, that you get in. You know, just this morning, you know, I woke up to find, you know, that 33 people in our company had received an email message from me saying, please send me, I need your contact information immediately. So just, you know, you know all every, I got lots of emails from my, my inbox saying, hey, Greg, was this really from you? And so, you know, the criminals are targeting every organization, you know, large and small, and all it takes is one person not to realize that that is a phishing attempt. And so that, you know, if you look at the, the volume of attacks, some of those, they're not necessarily always the, the most sophisticated, but they're playing a numbers game. If I can get one person to, to do something that they shouldn't, now I've got my foot in the door, and from there, where can I go, what can I see? Um, the scariest attacks, you know, I think that have, have really been surfaced recently, would be one that many of you probably heard about, because solar winds, which is a big we call it a supply chain attack where sophisticated intruders managed to embed you know, their malware inside the, the software that was being delivered by a, a trusted company, which is two thousands of, of customers of thousands of users around the world. And there was literally no way that most of those users could have detected that. It just, you know, the, the software that they were getting was from a legitimate source. You know, it was, you know, there was a trusted supplier. Um, and that took you know, the, one of the, the most sophisticated you know, security organizations in the world, FireEye, ultimately you know, found that, but they found it after you know, six plus months. And so if the, if the most sophisticated security company in the world or, or one of them you know, can't detect those things, you have to assume that there is you know, going to be malware, there is going to be in your networking, in your environment, and what you need to do is make sure that you've got those in security so that when that happens, you know, it does not turn into an incident that takes down your, your entire organization. That, that type of attack, that solar winds attack is really scary just because of how difficult it is to detect. And I think that, that opened up a lot of eyes. It says, you know what, you can't, you can't just focus on prevention. You've got to be able to focus on how are you going to remediate and how are you also going to mitigate the impact of any breach once it, once it occurs. How, do, how are you holding on to your faith in humanity? I mean, I think that this is true for any kind of protective service um and and perhaps with our um some of our folks here they would understand that question but like you deal with people or and organizations that choose to do bad things mm -hmm. and 
And how do you, how do you inoculate yourself against just hatred of those people? Like, how do you stay focused on the good in, in humanity? It's a, that's a, that's a big question. And I think that, you know, it, it is, you know, there are days when you, you look at it and say, wait a minute, like, we're in the midst of a pandemic, you know, and in the midst of that pandemic, attacks on hospital systems skyrocket. I mean, what kind of human being do you have to, to be to go and target a, a hospital where there are, that is being overwhelmed with COVID patients and, you know, try to, to disrupt their operations, to take advantage of it. And that's unfortunately the, the reality is that these, you know, these criminals, they're chaos junkies. Where there is turmoil, where there is, turmoil, that is exactly where they want to go because they know that in that environment, the willingness to pay is probably going to be you know, significantly higher because you're in the midst of a crisis. The last thing you could, you could possibly have in the midst of your, a crisis in healthcare is all of your, your infusion pumps you know, going, going down or having to revert to pencil and paper. So how you keep your faith in humanity is just recognizing that there are a lot more good people out there who are working and are doing their, their best. They're being very diligent, trying to follow processes and procedures. They're trying to protect you know, their organizations. And I think the, where I take the inspiration is say, for every, you know, for every criminal that are, is out there trying to attack a hospital system in the midst of coronavirus, there were thousands of nurses and doctors and healthcare workers that were putting their lives on the line to protect people. And say, you know what? I'll I'll align myself with those people you know, every day. I can dedicate myself to trying to make their jobs easier and, and help them, and, and have faith that if we if we do that, the world will be better off as a result. But there are an awful lot of good people, but there are you know when you're dealing with the, the criminals, you know it's it's awfully hard to, to remember that. Um, Marcelin just said, "Team humanity." Uh, yeah. So I think you have a lot of folks, service oriented folks here, who who are feeling you. Um, Dare has a question. He says, how does order convey the importance of network and device security to the general public? And I think that this is so crucial because people like me, mm -hmm. like aren't living this reality every day. It wouldn't even occur to me that my toilet paper dispenser could be doing something bad. Like that just would never, never enter my mind. And so how do you bring folks like me along on this journey and make sure that we're, we're making responsible decisions? It's um, it is a, a great question, and I would clarify: we're we're not a company that sells to kind of consumers. We sell to, to to businesses, so we we don't typically spend a lot of our time kind of speaking to you know my mother, my cousin about. Something. But I think the one of the ways I think that it is really and it is critically important that you know organizations, the company, educate their employees to be thinking about. You know, security and cybersecurity issues. Because if you think about, you know, back in the, the early you know, 90s, when I was first in kind of a management role, we used to think about, we'd have business continuity conversations. And I'm in California. And so we had all these meetings about what's going to happen when the earthquake comes? How do we keep this business running when the, the earthquake comes? Now, if you think about things that could disrupt your business or, or your life, it is far more likely that there's going to be a cybersecurity incident that happens than that there's going to be a major act of God that impacts you. So if you think about your, your personal world, you know, if someone got a hold of your, your bank account or if someone got into your benefits and redirected your paycheck from your bank account to someone else's bank account, that's something that's going to disrupt your life in the same way that someone taking over the, the manufacturing line at an, an automotive plant is going to disrupt the manufacturer's business. So I think it's it's really educating people that, and I think now it's you know easier than it's ever been because there have been these pretty well publicized incidents, you know, of pipelines and manufacturers you know being being taken down, and I think that's it's really important that people start to ask those questions and they you know to about what can they do and what's their responsibility to help their organization protect you know, the data and what can they do in their personal lives to make sure that they're that it's protected. Um, you know, it's, you know, that education is, you know, critically important. We have a, one of our you know, employees in our organization, you know, had their, their email hacked, you know, and they're you know, very sophisticated thinkers, but, you know, about cybersecurity issues, but hadn't changed the, the password in, you know, a couple of years on their email account. Well, that, that's pretty, you know, basic kind of hygiene. You need to make sure that 
you know, people are, and organizations need to make sure that people are aware of and thinking about those issues, because that really is kind of the first line of defense. Thank you, Greg. Roland has a question. He says, thank you for your time, Greg. He says, from a security standpoint, what are your thoughts on closed versus open source development? And how do you think the software and technology space will evolve as IoT continues to grow into every sector? That's a, it's a great and a very a big question. I think that one of the, the things that we're, we're really focused on, I think the, the industry is focused on, um, starting with, and in, in some cases, the, the healthcare industry, is kind of the, the concept of a, a software bill of materials, of understanding so, you know, when you buy a system, when you buy a solution you know, from a provider, that you understand what that contains, you know, what is, what's built into that software. That's, you know, that's critically important. It's kind of the, the analogy I'd use is it's the ingredients list you know, for, you know, and just like you, you don't typically go in or if you're conscious of, of what you're eating, you check the ingredients list you know, on the, the package at the, the grocery store, you, know, you want to know if you're, what you're buying and because then you can start to say, okay, now if we have a, we know there is a, a software a malware attack that is targeted at a particular software package, you know, an open source software package, you know, then we we now know, you know, that we are exposed. And we can now go and say, okay, which of our devices, which of our systems might have that exposure? So greater transparency, greater visibility will help organizations ensure that they close off vulnerabilities, but it'll also help respond much more, much more quickly. And you can probably sense a, a lot of our, our customers that I deal with are in the healthcare space. And this a, a few years ago, there was a pretty major incident you know, of you know, WannaCry that caused you know, hospital systems literally to be reverting back to pencil and paper as all of their, their kind of core systems were taken down. And part of the, the challenge was when the security teams at those hospitals would ask the question, well, which of our systems are actually vulnerable to WannaCry? Which, which might have a problem? They couldn't answer the question because they didn't know what software was running on all those devices. So they actually had to default to, well, disconnect everything. And now we have to go kind of one by one and verify whether these devices are vulnerable. And if so, you know, we need to patch them or apply some sort of remediation. So, this whole concept of greater visibility and greater transparency is really, really critical to fast response when something when something happens. So you can zero in very quickly on which devices, which systems, which applications are are vulnerable and respond quickly. Mm -hmm. And Greg, there are a collection of questions around order as an organization. How are you thinking about building out the company over the next 12 to 18 months? What teams are growing? What skill sets do you all really need? What are you looking for as you sort of project out what your needs will be? That's a, it's a great question. And the, and the you know, needs for an, an organization like ours, we have, we have tremendous needs. Right? Finding, finding people with Kind of data science, data security you know, background is always you know, always challenging. And so that is you know, number you know, number one. You know, who are the, the people who understand data science? The you know, developers who understand cybersecurity. But then you know, the, I would also say that like you've been talking about, and you asked the question of like, how do you educate the the public? How do you educate people about these people who can translate these kind of con, you know, these complicated you know, technical into stories that resonate with, you know, with end users that help them understand what we do and, and why it's important. So that type of resource, those are you know, people who are in, in marketing and sales and you know, we call business development rep, you know, representatives, people who are having that first conversation with a, a potential customer and are really trying to, to determine whether there is a fit. There's, you know, People who can translate technical conversation and technical concepts into kind of plain English that can be understood by prospective customers on the other side you know, are critically important. And then, you know, customer support and customer you know, customer success. The, the people you know, to to go and deal work with customers on a day in day out basis you know, with that that customer oriented mindset, understanding of the, the technology but an absolute you know, the grit and determination to make sure that their customers succeed. So all of, all of those areas, but finding people with knowledge of you know, cybersecurity and security, 
is always a, a challenge and it's critically important. And I know you've got a lot of you know, service members and other folks in UN who, who may have those experiences. And I think that's, you know, that's a great skill set to have because it's an incredible demand right now across every industry. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg. Jessica has a question. She says, what is your philosophy for data and the use of data? Is there a need for a demilitarized zone between certain networks and devices and other public networks? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a great question. Um, Lara, I think that the, the view is you know, for organizations is really to do the best job they can of defining who and what needs access to particular data in particular systems so that you can regulate that very closely. And this is you know, where, where we really focus is by using machine learning and, you know, and AI to determine that. So you can monitor, you know, say, go, I'll go back again to my favorite example of the security cameras. If I can watch you know, a thousand security cameras in your environment within a few days, a short period of time, I can figure out what systems those devices need to speak to, what protocols they use, what data they, they need access to. And once I have that, that allows me to kind of build an intelligent kind of set of rules. That would, and so I think they, the, the question really comes down to how do you regulate data access? First, you need to be able to define what data does a person, what data does a system you know, need access to. And I think the only way in today's world with so many connected systems, so many connected devices and entities, the only way to do that is using technology. There's no human being that can go around and survey you know, all of the, the users, all of the devices and build these complicated maps. That's something that has to be done through, you know, through machine learning. Um, Greg, I'm gonna wrap it up with a final question from our MVP Partha today. Mm -hmm. And um, he's raising a topic that we actually talked about as we were preparing for this conversation. He says, Greg, how do you cope with and overcome imposter syndrome? Perhaps, especially when starting a new role or pivoting into a new sector. Uh, the, the imposter syndrome of you know, how do you, you know, get over the fact that you feel like an imposter? Is that the one? Well, yeah, or, and even drawing from your own experience, yeah. you know, moments where you felt a little fragile, a little vulnerable as you're, as you're making a move. How, how did you kind of push past that? No, it's a, it's a, a, it is a great question. And I think it is something, I don't think you, you push past it because every day you come up and you experience it again and again. It's, it's not, I think any time that someone, if a CEO was being really honest to, with you, the first time they, they took a job as a CEO, you know, they said, oh my God, there are areas of our business that I really don't know that much about. You know, I, I came up, my, my background was in engineering, or I came up from the, the sales side or the marketing side. So you've got usually a depth of expertise in, in one area, and now you're responsible for everything. You know, and that, that's, you know, clearly happens to CEOs, but I think it's, it happens in every job. And so you, everyone, when you take a new job, an expanded set of responsibilities say, oh my God, you know, there is so much I don't know. And people, this, this feeling that people are expecting me to be the expert because I'm responsible for this area. And I think the, the only way that I've been able to, to work through those issues is, is by not being afraid to ask questions. Um, if, you're, if you're fear you know, looking stupid, you know, and if fear of asking a, a dumb question prevents you from getting knowledge that you need, well, then you're not going to be able to, to do your job. So I would rather run the risk of, you know, looking foolish in an instant than looking, you know, than not getting the, the knowledge and the information that I need to, to be successful. And I think the, the other piece is just always having a group of trusted folks and advisors, people that you can go to, whether they're inside the company or outside the company, and say, you know what? I just, I'm looking at this problem. I don't know how to solve it. Have you encountered this, you know, this before? Sometimes I get the expect, yes, they give me a direct answer, but more often than not, it's just having someone you can talk through the issue with. And very often I find, I kind of know the answer. I just needed someone to help me get there. And sometimes I'm just talking through that problem to kind of arrive at your, your own conclusion. So I would, I would just say, if you don't feel like an imposter, you're probably not being you know, aggressive enough you know, in kind of developing your, your career because it's when you're making those leaps 
when you have that feeling of uncertainty, it's where you have the greatest ability to, to grow and frankly, to, to add more value to, to your organization. Uh, so I, don't have a, I don't have a cure for it. I think it's something we all live with. Mic drop. Thank you so much, Greg. This has been such a treat. Thank you for joining us for the last hour. Absolutely fascinating conversation. So appreciate the fact that you carved out time when you clearly have extremely important things to turn your attention to. So thank you so much, Greg, for joining us. And thanks to everybody for being here today. It's a pleasure to have you all. It's, a, it's an honor to talk to this group in, in Bethany. If anyone uh, wants to get a hold of me, please feel free to pass along my, my contact information. I'd love to help anyone on this call. So if you have any questions, if I can do any help at all, just reach out to me.